Well, again, apologies for not being um, on time, but let's see what we can think about. And, and I'm really interested in this workshop because I've been talking about this for a while and I'm tired of my ideas. I'm really interested in new ideas. So biosignatures and technosignatures, you just heard a nice talk by Edward about some of the differences there, but um, I think that both are reasonable under an astrobiology uh, program. And it's been uh, frustrating for me that we have been excluded for a while. So what we're trying to do is find habitable worlds through the actions of the inhabitants. And um, we started with a search for communication. So we've had 50 years of plus of, of SETI in the optical and the radio. And we've been looking for obviously engineered signals, meaning that we've been looking for frequency compression and or time compression that nature does not permit. So we've looked for a single frequency on the radio dial, a single nanosecond pulse in time, and um, more recently for monochromatic laser SETI beams with um, embedded information. So um, there are um, two kinds of signals that uh, we could imagine. There are the signals that are almost natural, which we would catch in uh, a large astronomical search of the, the heavens. And then there are are things like, for example, a pulsar that had a single period and then switched its period and then changed its period again and then again. So we found pulsars that have a change in their period because of star quakes, but we've never found one that went from period one to period two, back to period one and then period two again. But if we, they, they would show up in our databases if we analyze them, and that's almost natural. So we've also just been talking about transits, uh, planetary transits and what you could see through their atmospheres. But um, one of the things that the uh, IAU has told us is that planets by definition are spherical. And so the shadows on their uh, stars would have a particular look in their uh, light curves. But indeed, if there were artificial transients, things that were put there to look unlike uh, natural planets, you could find that information in the um, higher orders of the uh, spectrum in, of the light curves at ingress and egress. So, uh, we could look for that. The other thing is, how about star tickling? How about taking a Cepheid variable, which has a normal period, and as it expands, it gets brighter, and then it contracts and gets dimmer. How about taking a Cepheid, and just as it is in its dim phase, and thinking about getting brighter, how about zapping it with some energy, neutrino beam, or something else, that makes it expand prematurely. Now you've got a Morse code Cepheid. You have a Cepheid with a normal period and a short period, and they can be seen, for example, across the, um, the galaxy and out to the Virgo cluster. Another idea is uh, if you've got time, if you're not in a hurry, you could take some material and inscribe information at almost the atomic level, and then throw rocks among the uh, uh, stellar systems and planetary systems. And you might, in fact, be able to discover one of these strange uh, meteorites in your collection, such as we have pieces of Mars and the Moon within our meteor collection, and discover that there's information content there. So those are almost natural. You don't have to do anything more than look at data that you're collecting in the way that you would normally collect it for astronomy and astrophysics. Um, we've had uh, 50 years of, of searching 
of setting to date for communication signals. Um, 60 years on, it's more like a little hot tub rather than a glass of water. Uh, and we, we live in a multi-messenger universe, right? There are, we've been looking for photons for a long time, but now we know that there are other messengers that can carry uh, information between the stars. And we've begun to think about looking there. Um, on the other hand, given the funding levels that SETI is likely to uh, address um, or be able to access, I think it's really correct to say that, and here, here's Michael Hipke's really nice uh, analysis of the different ways that we might be able to get information across the universe. I think it's relatively safe to say that in the near future, we're still going to be stuck with photons and electromagnetic waves as we're looking for techno signatures. So what can we do? We can look for artifacts and it's now feasible only within the solar system. Um, and on Earth, history, recorded history, a few thousand years. Archaeology gives us a few 10,000 years, and geology resurfacing the planet means that artifacts are going to be around only for about 100 million years. And now there's a recent suggestion that um, if we weren't looking for electromagnetic indications of techno signatures if we were thinking about neutrinos as being our information carrying uh, particles then um, although we can't find the neutrino beam itself in our laboratories we might in fact be able to uh, detect the presence of a modulated neutrino beam because it would change the rate of um, decay of uh, the manganese radioisotope, 54 manganese, um, in the lab. That's, that's a bit of a wild card, but indeed, maybe that would be an indication of someone uh, providing us an artifact in our laboratory with a neutrino beam. All right, on the moon, uh, we haven't been able to search subsurface or for features that are less than about 10 meters in scale. And um, in the solar system itself, we should think about looking for artificial lighting or transmi transmitters on asteroids or ice flowers on comets, as Freeman Dyson suggested, and then these L4 and L5 Lagrange points in our Earth-Sun um, solar system. Uh, there's been a suggestion that something called the Kartalewski clouds, which some people see and some people fail to find, might in fact be um, filled with manufactured uh, probes made by molecular manufacturing that could be little diamondoid nanobots. Um, we've recently been intrigued by uh, Amuamua uh, and are now thinking about the fact that um, this might represent something that we've long known in science fiction, which is um, rendezvous with Rama, a distant spacecraft in our solar system. And so uh, we've all looked at Oumuamua, a number of, of teams have done that, looking for artificial transmitters on that body. And um, we've been intrigued to think about within our solar system, looking for space archeology span that uh, worlds that are dead at their own hands. Bio, biology can kill a planet as well as technology. And so um, 
we've had to assume that we can then not just look within our own solar system for artifacts, but in fact, bodies entering the solar system might give us access to other solar systems. So let's think about what technologies do and how we might look for them. Um, okay, we can harvest energy to do work. And then the question is what kind of energy is being used? Uh, so the observable consequences for different energy forms. Um, Edward just mentioned uh, the uh, different carbon fluorides, uh, carbon uh, compounds that are the pollutants of our own technology might actually uh, grace other atmospheric solar system, uh, atmospheric uh, compositions of different distant exoplanets, but the amount of observing time that is required to go looking for this kind of pollution uh, amid the Milky Way is quite exorbitant, unlikely to be obtainable, but who knows what will happen when JWST finally launches. Um, if it's um, fissile waste, uh, if it's nuclear fission that's the uh, source of energy, then we can think about uh, the disposal of fissile waste into the host star. And if anyone was doing that with sufficient uh, volume, then you could uh, imagine that you would get an enhancement of the rare earth elements such as chrysodymium and neodymium. And Shabilsky's star is one example where you have uh, such an increase, but no one has yet suggested that this really is evidence of uh, nuclear technology in a distant star system. All right, if it's tritium, if it's fusion rather than fission, then there might be tritium leakage that would be uh, detectable because tritium has the equivalent of the 1420 uh, megahertz line of hydrogen at uh, 15, 16 megahertz, but the half-life of tritium is so short that if you found that line emission anywhere except right around a recent supernova, you would have a very puzzling piece of potential techno signatures to uh, explain. All right, other kinds of work. Well, you, we use to transfer information is one of the things that we use energy to do. Uh, and when in fact the first gamma ray bursts were found, we wondered about whether um, those might be the annihilation accelerations of photon rockets, right? half an MeV of uh, matter-antimatter annihilations. And it was also suggested that if it's not uh, relativistic travel, but very slow ships, then they might stop off in our solar system to replenish uh, materials, in which case uh, they might be in the asteroid belt orbiting some asteroid. And so a double asteroid would be a really interesting detection. But in fact, we found double asteroids and so far they're just a couple of rocks. So um, not terribly interesting as techno signatures. And finally, we have been thinking about uh, laser acceleration or microwave acceleration of uh, targets to get near the speed of light to do interstellar exploration. And so um, something like breakthrough starshot lasers are visible across a vast array of space. And we should be looking for that kind of uh, consequence of doing work. And faster than light travel, well, okay, I put this up because you can't ignore it, but I don't know what the observational consequences might be. All right, so now 
we think about observational consequences of husbanding a planet and how would we tell a natural versus an engineered exoplanet, right? So it might have um, an unexpected albedo or glint from orbiting mirrors. It might have a surface temperature that's wrong for its distance from its, habit, its uh, host star. It might, uh, in fact, lack extreme weather because that's more comfortable for advanced life, but I don't know how you would detect that. And finally, it, you could think about, it might have latitudinal homogeneity, right? You might have changed your weather so your whole planet was benign and uh, suitable for your habit. And then what about having multiple identical planets within one solar system. Suppose when we get these 30 and 40 meter ground-based or advanced orbital telescopes such as HAVEX or LUVOIR, suppose when we look at something like the TRAPPIST-1 system, we see that three or more of those planets are all the same suppose that there's been some geoengineering within the system that has rearranged uh, with a great deal of energy the surface of the planets so that there's more potential habitable real estate than there was initially. Might we discuss that there were some, uh, some engineers out there? And what about having a, an incredibly well-populated geosynchronous belt, um, something called a Clark exobelt around your planet, something that was at the same radius but extended in height and uh, was populated with enough density that in fact, when you looked at the light curve from, reflected from such a planet that you could detect uh, all of these services in uh, geosynchronous or geoplanetary orbits. And finally, if you do enough modification in a solar system, you will eventually end up having an influence on the star itself. So in terms of these megastructures, you would see uh, an infrared excess uh, versus the stellar type. You might see the star over centuries disappear because the light is blocked by megastructures. And finally, you might end up having a population of stars whose spectroscopic distances are greater than the parallax distances that we get from Gaia and its subsequent um, missions because you've actually dimmed the star with your megastructure. Um, as I said before, you might end up getting glints from orbiting mirrors that are used to warm the dark sides of tidally locked exoplanets or somehow in looking with incredible resolution at distant exoplanets you might find that there's some evidence of resource extraction from their asteroid belt. And finally, if you think about whether biology actually ends up turning into technology and the biological entities are replaced by uh, machines, then you might think about, well, suppose that um, a super intelligent singleton um, is improperly uh, constrained and given um, a goal, for example, to make a million paper clips. Well, that singleton, that machine intelligence, is only going to be able to decide that it has fulfilled its goal on a statistical basis. And so it will um, never be quite sure. And so 
it will make more paper clips and eventually it will turn everything into paper clips or paper clip manufacturing capability. And so um, a uniformity uh, that is uncharacteristic of a stellar system might in fact indicate the presence of a, um, a distant technology. Okay, so this is generalized artificial intelligence and where would we look for it? Well, it needs an energy source, so it might surround a host star, and you would see a, a thermal infrared excess, and then you would also be expecting to see signals between this Montreal brain and others. And um, as you go out from the central source of energy, the next gen the next ring of computation would be powered by the heat loss from the inner ring. And so you need to think about where might these kinds of computational uh, engines be placed? Well, how about next to sources of, of a lot of energy like black holes or neutron stars? And I remember the pulsar planets that we first found before we found actual planets, terrestrial type planets. And I wonder what the explanation for those might be. Or you might expect these kinds of technologies to be at the edges of the Milky Way galaxy because they have access to colder regions around them and it's easier to exhaust their waste heat. So lots of things to think about with respect to the observable consequences of, of doing work. Uh, and the thing that's really fantastic right now and why it's wonderful that we're having this workshop now is that there's a huge opportunity for improvement, right? We've got lots of fast computing. We are beginning to have access to the transient sky. Uh, we could perhaps uh, detect neutrinos as well as photons indirectly. We're beginning to be able to use artificial intelligence and neural networks to look at the data in a way that's um, agnostic. We're not telling it anymore to look for particular patterns in frequency and time. We're asking the artificial intelligence to tell us whether there's anything anomalous within a particular data set. There's lots of data sets and the opportunity for data mining uh, there's, um, we're beginning to bring in the social scientists to help us understand how perhaps better to look for evidence of technology. And we're beginning to have formal instruction at the university level for undergraduates and graduate students and, and therefore expanding our community. So we built some specific telescopes to look for techno signatures like the Allen Telescope Array and Breakthrough Listen is putting uh, enhanced back ends on otherwise existing telescopes from the radio astronomy community. And there are um, searches going on. We're not quite sure what's gonna happen with Arecibo now that Breakthrough um, the, the SETI at home has collected an enormous amount of data and is stepping back and rethinking how they're going to use that data rather than necessarily capturing more. But we can imagine that there will be other commensal searches on Arecibo. Um, LOFAR, two telescopes, uh, two, two locations of the LOFAR array in Sweden and in Ireland are beginning to look for low frequency transients. A, a telescope in Sardinia is beginning to work on SETI. Uh, the, down at the Deep Space Network in, um, uh, in Southern California, they've moved one of the t telescopes outside the fence. And now we have the Goldstone Apple Valley radio telescope that's being run by students to do a sky survey. 
and the Melora Widefield Array is also beginning to do sky surveys at low frequencies for SETI. Um, optical SETI, uh, Harvard specifically uh, built telescope. All of the data that's being taken at Keck for radial velocity studies of exoplanets is also being reanalyzed looking for engineered signals. Uh, there's um, amateur telescopes in uh, Panama and elsewhere doing optical SETI. Uh, the um, Lick Observatory has moved optical SETI into the infrared and it's also possible to do archival SETI as the GHAT survey of WISE um, has done looking for Keck 2 and Keck 3, I'm sorry, Kardashev 2 and Kardashev 3 types of civilizations. We've taken the Veritas Gamma, Gamma Ray Observatory and written new software so that we're looking at individual pixels in the uh, 500 pixel cameras of these telescopes which light up on the sky all simultaneously. Uh, in the optical, Shelley Wright in, in San Diego is looking at these half meter Fresnel lenses, uh, focusing a large area of the sky onto an array of detectors that are um, now possible. Uh, looking at um, uh, their, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name, never mind. Um, so we have the idea of building a, uh, a geodesic dome with these lenses that are focusing a large piece of the sky onto these uh, photodiodes and being able to look at a large area of the sky at the same time. Uh, and the first two of these elements that would go into a geodesic dome are now exist at, uh, they've been installed at Lick Observatory and they're being engineering testing is going on. Uh, another idea is not a a big dome, not a big telescope, but an inexpensive system based on cameras that um, is being worked on by Elliot Gillum at the SETI Institute. And the idea is, again, looking at all the sky above the horizon and looking for fast monochromatic pulses. So uh, with the gratings that Elliot has in place, you can see that continuum sources are spread out uh, across the detector, whereas monochromatic sources have individual points that make them quite detectable. And when you actually put this on the sky for engineering tests, it's a lot more noisy than that nice uh, conceptual layout that I just showed you, but the first Half Observatory is now in place at Ferguson Observatory in Northern California in Sonoma. And the next observatory, if we can figure out how to do the quarantining, will go on Haleakala in Hawaii. And so you can see that spread across the globe, about 15 sites will give you full sky coverage. You're looking at all the sky all the time for these kinds of transient signals. And here's something which has been proposed by um, Jeff Kuhn in Hawaii. And it is more like uh, an a radio interferometer than it is a standard optical telescope. But if you phase up these collecting um, areas, you can in fact over many orbital, I'm sorry, many um, cycles of planetary orbiting around its pro primary star. In fact, this single telescope would look at the Proxima Centauri system and probably nothing else. But with enough orbital periods, you can in fact deconstruct 
uh, the light curves to give you an image that would allow you to detect cottons and dis distinguish them from oceans and do uh, searches for biosignatures uh, at specific locations on that nearby exoplanet. So we're looking to the future. We're looking to the things that the astronomical community is talking about building. The, the 30 and 40 meter class telescopes, uh, the uh, um, this large synoptic sky telescope that will give you an image of the sky every few days to look for things that are changing. And we need to think about how SETI can commensally observe with these new instruments in um, the optical and also we're looking about the exploring expanding panel SETI and laser SETI which neither of which is fully funded and we're thinking about how to uh, improve the kinds of searches that we can do with the Veritas telescopes and in the Radio, we're thinking about Meerkat and the Square Kilometer Array to be, Meerkat is now functioning Square Kilometer Array, hopefully in the next decade. And the FAST telescope in China is beginning to have backends that um, may allow us to do much more sensitive radio searches. If we're lucky, the next generation VLA will also allow us to do SETI. And if we ever make that um, ELF telescope, the ExoLife Finder work, then this is its big brother, Colossus, which will be able to find the heat signatures of the equivalent of cities on uh, nearby exoplanets. Uh, JWST, we've talked about what it could find in terms of pollutants in the atmospheres. We're thinking about the Roman telescope and perhaps in the future, a star shade to go with telescopes like that, HABEX or LUVOIR, um, these will give us biosignatures, as has been said in the previous talk. And there's this enormous suite of exoplanet uh, missions that will in give us new information that we can interrogate for potential technosignatures as well as biosignatures. Um, so there are lots of opportunities to look for life and technology beyond Earth. And I think that it's really important that this whole community continues to talk about these opportunities because we have all of these global challenges on this planet if we're to have a long future. And I think that projects like um, SETI and the search for technosignatures, the search for biosignatures, can help us see ourselves in a mirror that shows us that across this particular planet, we're all the same when compared to thinking about something that may have evolved somewhere else. And so it trivializes the differences among us. And that leads me to Caleb Sharp's final words, that on a finite world, a cosmic perspective isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. So thank you.